Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Forgotten Feminists. Forgotten Feminists is sponsored by The Spectator. As longest running magazine in the world, The Spectator believes that journalism must be witty and insightful, that ideas should be discussed without the constant threat of cancellation. The Spectator never confuses the serious with the dull. It isn't right wing, it isn't left wing. It believes in challenging, informing, and entertaining readers. Since its foundation in 1828, its mission has been to convey intelligence, not ideology. Sign up today and you'll receive three free months of both the print and digital magazine, plus a free spectator hat. Just use the offer code Yasmin at checkout to redeem the special offer just for listeners of Forgotten Feminists. Thanks again. Welcome, right. Michelle. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is an absolute pleasure to see your gorgeous smile. And I just love that you are sitting in front of all of those haram drinks right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, to start off our conversation, I'm going to just like jump right in. So um, you are of Somali descent. Your family is from Somalia, but you grew up in Saudi Arabia. Now yes. there's a couple things I want to know about Saudi Arabia. I want to know, first of all, um, what's it like as a Somali young girl growing up in Saudi Arabia? So there's, um, there's this, one of the overarching ideas that we hear all the time, one of the tropes, sorry, I keep on getting distracted. People keep on coming in, so I have to admit them. <laughs> one of the tropes that we hear all the time is the Muslim ummah is all equal. We're all equals, and there's no difference between one Muslim and another. And that hasn't been my experience. I have seen some things no. that counter that. Um, yeah. So I'd like you to tell me about your experience growing up in Saudi Arabia. Um, okay. Um, well, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mishar. I get to be a little nervous when I take a talk in front of people. So I'm just going to talk and I am sure I'll be fine with you all. Seeing all your faces, it kind of calms me down. Um, so, yes, like you said, Yasmin, I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia. My parents are Somali. I have never been to Somalia. Mm. My parents decided to come to Saudi Arabia for a couple of reasons. One, they wanted to raise their kids in a country that's not as poor as Somalia and have access to education and medical and another reason was for um, religion. My parents are religious and they wanted us to be religious and grow up in the rules and laws and everything in Saudi Arabia. And now, yes, that was very difficult for me growing up. I was there in, I was born in 1987 and I left in 2014 and that was compared to today it was way more strict and it was very difficult and I remember for example my education was limited and my access to um, things that I would need as a woman was definitely restrictive now, I grew up in between um, this confusion because my parents were less strict than the other families. So we had music in our home and we had um, satellite channels like MTV and all of these things. So we, would, we could watch cartoons in English and everything like that. But people around us would try so hard to control us and they would somehow think they're taking control over my parents parenting because they would think that my parents are basically not as strict as they're supposed to be 
So I remember, and one thing you should know about my parents is that they're the people, they're the only people I have met in my life who can be easily mani manipulated. And it's so easy to manipulate my parents. And I remember, for example, we would be having a normal day, you know, we just wake up, there's music in our home and everything. And then some people would just visit us and my parents would completely change because people would just point at the things that are wrong in our home. And I, I remember that was very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that was, that was growing up basically in Saudi and uh, life was definitely very, very strict. Yeah. As so, you all know, I'm guessing it's going to be a very repetitive vocabulary, the whole strictive, forbidden, and everything. But haram, haram, haram. Exactly. Yeah. That's like a trending word. If you have like yeah. Twitter, that would be like the first word on yeah. the trending word. Yeah, everything is haram. Um, so, but I found I find it interesting that you recognize that it was strict when you hadn't grown up anywhere else like you were only in Saudi Arabia so you see all the girls around you being restricted in the same way you were and probably even worse than you were but you still felt something in your heart or in your mind like you knew this is a restrictive society Yes, I did. I knew it. And uh, my revolution. Because... Tell me. I was going to ask you, is it because of the policing of the people around you constantly trying to shame your parents into being more strict? So I guess that's kind of what would help you to realize like, okay, these people are really trying to, to suffocate us here, even music. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I didn't know before that, you know, growing up in it, you don't really know the difference. But my revolution really started when I was only 10 years old. Uh, I don't know if most of you know, uh, Mother Teresa died. And when she died, I was 10 years old. And I remember um, I was in school and I was very sad. I was really touched by that. And she was an idol, I just loved her. I mean, she was incredible. And I remember uh, my school teacher, uh, and by the way, I went to a boys and girls school, oh, which changed okay. later on, mm. but we will get to that later. And uh, my teacher um, said to me, why are you, are you okay? He, he was checking on me. And I remember telling him, I'm sad because Mother Teresa passed away yesterday. And I remember he said, yeah, it's okay. I mean, she's Christian. She's going to burn in hell. And just those words hurt me so bad. I can still feel it. It's so painful to say these words to a 10-year-old child. To what a weird response. You You're already it sad. <laughs> and it's like he decided to make it worse. But I think in a way... I don't know whether he was trying to calm himself down or calm me down, <laughs> whatever he was trying, it did not work. And you just imagine that, it was so difficult for me. And then, you know, when you were a kid, the only people you trust are your parents and your teachers. And I went back to, when I went back home, my father picked me up from school and I remember telling him the story. I was like, can you believe this? My teacher said that Mother Teresa is going to burn in hell. Like she's in hell already. And my father, I mean, I had this hope that my father is going to say something else. He said the exact same thing. I mean, I, I thought he was there, that he mm -hmm. heard the same thing. He was like repeating it. And to me, that's when I thought, how can this happen like how are we okay with this and that's when it all started for me that's when you know mm. it did not went well after that obviously. yeah well that's that's yeah. so it came from a compassionate place your your questioning of this 
faith that tells you that others are going to burn in hell. It's, yeah, that's, that's sweet. I like that. You know, quite often it comes from a place of, you know, just an intellectual place. Sometimes it comes from an emotional place. Um, yeah. You know, just because of the constant restrictions on us as women, especially, you just get sick of it, you get angry. Um, but for you, it came from a real pure place of, of compassion. So that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, in Ion Hersiali's book, because she also grew up in, well, didn't grow up in Saudi Arabia, but she lived in Saudi Arabia for a few years also came from, well, not for you, because you're, you didn't live in Somalia, but she lived in Somalia and then moved to Saudi Arabia. And she experienced quite a bit of racism when she was there. And um, she talked about the word abid that they use to refer to Black people, which translated means slaves. And that's yes. a word that I've seen many um, you know, Twitter campaigns where people in Morocco and Algeria and all over the Arab world are speaking out against um, the racism in the Arab world. And me coming from Egypt, I, I saw it happening as well. Um, even, and there's, there's, there's such a, uh, there's such a judgment about, you know, hair types and, and, shades of skin color and it's almost it's so normalized so for me growing up in Canada and then moving to Egypt I was shocked because even if somebody wants to be racist in Canada they're going to be so quiet about it they're going to be so careful yeah. Yeah. but um same thing when we were living in Qatar one of the most you know I guess one of the situations that I felt so embarrassed too, because my husband was involved, he's a Canadian, and this Saudi or this uh, Qatari man tells him, uh, listen, because they were, he was selling him some computer part or something. And he says, I'm going to send my driver to come pick up the money. He's black, but don't worry about it. You can trust him. Yeah. And my husband was like, what did you just, you just what? say that? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like it, it's so embarrassing how, it's just so normalized. The, the, yes. the, the racism is like, um, it's not even an issue that has, or when I was there, I left in 2011, it, it wasn't even an issue that had been identified yet, let alone people starting to push back against it. So, what, so what was your experience or your family's experience? Um, well, I, I did face racism and um, it wasn't really bitter. I mean, or maybe I am just a very forgetful and forgiving person, thankfully. But uh, I really never had that sour, bitter thing. But maybe because now that I think about it, because, you know, now that I am far, I'm looking back and I see some stuff and I'm like, that was not right. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, for example, in school, um, they would say that white is beautiful. Black is not beautiful. And it was in a normal school. thing. And you would hear it every day. And you would just accept that because of your skin color, you were just cursed. <laughs> and you were just not pretty. And I actually believed that. And I remember, for example, um, there was like small things like in school, in every morning in the assembly, they pick a student to take the microphone and say some things. Like it could be a song, it could be a poet, it could be anything, but you have those five minutes. And I remember wanting to do that once. And then there was this teacher, I don't know whether she was a teacher or a substitute teacher, but I remember she said to me, because I said to her, Can I, how do I get in to do that? Do I register? What do I do? And I remember just, she, and I think it was innocent. She wasn't like saying it in a hateful way. And she was like, normally white kids are picked. Mm. And 
I, I remember not thinking it was wrong or I wasn't angry. I just thought, oh, okay, it's because I am black. Then, you know, they wouldn't want to put me in front of everyone because, you know, I don't want to scare people. I mean, I thought that was okay. And, you know, there were similar things like that. And, and this happened up until I was an adult, like when I went to Dubai and I remember I applied for a job and the, the, the man who was interviewing me said to me, we are looking for somebody to be at the lobby and say hello to guests because I work in hotels and I have an experience there. And I said, yeah, I can do that. I mean, I have an experience, so I know hospitality. And he said, yeah, no, your CV looks great. It's just that we're looking for someone more Russian or more, you know, that part of the world. And then, then I was an adult and yes, mm. I found that a little bitter. And mm. I said to him, is it because you're looking for a Russian speaker? I, I just want to know, you know, it, it, are there like Russian clients there and everything? I felt like I pushed it because mm. I just wanted to know. And honestly, the idea of the whole black and white got out of my head. I was not even mm. thinking that. And then he felt like I was pushing him and he just said, it's because you're black. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> and you know, those things, honestly, it never changed me. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I, I never wanted that to be a bitter thing in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole black and white to me, it's, I, I believe in equality and I stand for it. And I believe everybody is beautiful now. Now I learned that I am beautiful and I started to embrace my natural hair and I was like you know this is just who I am and mm -hmm. I feel like I feel I mean right now I feel so much love and respect and, and honor and everything and honestly I'm very thankful to that so that's but, yeah, interesting both exist. <laughs> because the the what you have described was my experience as well. It's not in a hateful way. It's just in a super normalized, un, they're, not, they're unaware of it even being a problem. I don't know how, like, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say, right? Like, exactly. And, it's so, so it, normal. It's just like the misogyny. It's so normal. You, you grow up as a girl not even wanting for yourself or thinking of yourself as a human being with desires or rights or or needs because you've never been you've nothing in society or in your family or in your environment gave you the idea that you should ever think that way so it's just yeah. like these really insidious dark toxic things are just so normalized that you don't even notice them and that's why in my book I said it's like you're a fish that doesn't even know that it's wet you're just surrounded by these things oh i loved your book i mean i feel like it's opened so many things for me and especially the the thing you talked about with heaven and i mean i'm just jumping to another subject right now mm -hmm, speaking mm -hmm. of your book but the subject about heaven and you know the the, the virgins waiting for men i mean and 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 the man saying i can take my wife to heaven mm. with me I mean, that was like watching a horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You get it because it's like I this, the, the prison bars are not going to just be on you here on earth, but for eternity, That's there's so no escape ever. Yeah. That was, uh, that was scary. Um, so I'm happy to hear that you went to, it sounds like an international school. So that's probably why you had boys and girls mixed together. Is that a correct assumption? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, um, one of the things that really surprised me when I moved to Qatar was how stark the contrast was, especially when you walk into the malls and all the men are wearing white and all the women are wearing black. It's like the segregation never stops. Yeah. And it's like, it, it, it's, it's so segregated. It's like they're wearing uniforms in real life to separate 
the two sexes like it, they're they're Absolutely. you go into a Starbucks and it's separated you know everywhere you go there's it's separated and then um you know, there's some day when you're told this is the person you're going to marry. And, you know, without having had any kind of interaction with anybody you from the opposite sex. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Now you got to let them take you. Um, so how weird was that for you to grow up in a, in a gender segregated country? Did that make you uncomfortable at all? Or was it just like everything else? It was just sort of normal and you, you didn't find it strange. Uh... I did not find it strange. Um, in a way, I was sometimes a little happy that I don't have to be around men because I just grew up in a country where men were so violent, angry, and their job is to just hate women. I mean, I don't know if it's a job, I mean, yeah, some people made it a job. There's actually Islamists. They get mm. paid to do that, to control women. I mean, that's And there was so, religious um, police back then when you were there, right? Were they still? Yeah. yeah. So yes, they go around whipping police. your ankles if your ankles are showing or telling you to or they would shout tuck at your you. hair in. Mm. Yes. So sometimes when I would find myself in a place that's only women, in a way I would feel relaxed yeah. that now I don't have fear or, or there's no violence around me. And mm -hmm. in my school, it was the same. My male teachers were actually very angry people. And I was so scared of them and I don't know. I mean, it was just, and, and then it loosened up the whole segregation. So now restaurants started to open up. I worked in a hotel and uh, I see one of the members here, uh, Roa, who is here. She also worked with me in the same hotel. Hi, beautiful. Um, so in that hotel, for example, we had um, main, men and women could dine in together in the same place. There was no closed places. Mm -hmm. But people think it's open. It's not. You, you have these angry Islamists walking in anytime they want, you know, just checking your identity and who are you and what is going on and what is this? And... I don't know, for me, honestly, living there in that environment, I was happy being just around women. Mm -hmm. That's totally understandable. It's very sad, but it's completely yeah. understandable. Um, so now I wanna talk about sort of your, your change, your, you know, turning into the butterfly. And you say that that happened from being able to travel and uh, experiencing different cultures and meeting new people. I find it interesting that racism was so normalized in an Arab country, but now you're in France where everybody is supposed to be racist and hateful, but that's where you learned to appreciate your beauty and to appreciate your natural hair and to understand that we're all humans and to not have these judgments between shades of color. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me about traveling and, and what that did for your mind and for your heart. Traveling definitely changed my life. And I started traveling to Middle East at the beginning. So it was like baby steps. So I mm -hmm. went from home to Bahrain, which is four hours by car. And I lived there and I could see the difference, huge difference already. Women could do anything. They could drive, mm -hmm. work, they could be bartenders and they did not need a male presence or guardian, whatever they walk or go or run to. And it was liberating for me. And then I traveled to Dubai and pretty similar, really, I mean, Yes, it was liberating, but still the society is holding back. 
And after being to many places, I think France is what truly, truly opened my eyes. I just, it's, I came to this country and I do not speak a single French language. So when people talk, you, you, you can't use your ears, so you use your eyes. So you just watch people. You just sit back and watch their behavior, how they laugh, how they talk, their, how they express themselves, everything. You just, I, it wasn't like in a creepy way, no. like staring. <laughs> it was like a more admiring way. Yeah. And I, I, I saw them and I could feel that freedom coming from within. You know, the, wow. the, 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 it was like music. It was, mm -hmm. it, it was so beautiful. And I saw many things that I have never seen before. Like for example, the metros. I remember when my husband was telling me, we're gonna take the metro. And I was like, where is that? And he said to me, it's underground. And I was like, so we're gonna be like rats traveling underground. <laughs> I mean, do you now see how wrong that is? <laughs> And, and then, of course, you know, the, the French are very connected to nature. So they would like take tents in the weekends and they would sleep in the nature. And I would feel bad for them. I would feel like these poor homeless people. <laughs> and it's not, they have homes. They have everything. They just decided. They choose to, <laughs> to they sleep chose outdoors. To <laughs> <their camp. laughs> and that happened to me. When my husband came back home with a tent and he was like mm. we're going to sleep outside and i said to him are we gonna lose the house is there something you want to tell me <laughs> and, and he was like no we're just gonna sleep under the the trees and and the stars and everything and i gotta say i know everyone hears that black people don't like camping it is true we do me not neither. <laughs> me neither <laughs> I, I always find that. it so weird. Yeah, I the same thing. I I'm the same as you. I'm like I don't understand. I have a home. Why am I sleeping in a sleeping bag on the dirt? Yeah. And I took videos, and you know, I send it to people. And, and back in the Middle East, I'm like, guys, these people have homes, cars, everything, but here they are camping. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. So no, definitely traveling really it changed me from within to be honest with you i think um it's it's a truly unbelievable experience you mentioned islamists before and i know we hear a lot about the islamists in france and the rest of the world especially when there's cases like the bataclan theater or samuel petit or charlie abdo i mean the list goes on and on how do you feel as an ex-Muslim living in France with all of the Islamists around? Do you feel that your government, the steps that they're taking with clamping down on Islamist mosques that, are, that have like homophobia or anti-Semitism or any kind of, you know, calls to jihad or stuff like that, um, or the work that they're doing with Islamic schools and things like that, what? do you feel comfortable with those kinds of um policy changes or do you do you feel uncomfortable do you feel happy how, what is your how do you feel living there with all of the islamists around you uh so i am very happy about that france is france has a law called laicity and mm -hmm. this law applies to all religions and basically it says you should be a person and not a symbol of a religion mm -hmm. and the only people the only religion who has problem with it is i'm guessing you all guessed it muslims mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they are the only ones who play the victims and say don't touch my hijab um you know and they, they start calling out these words homophobia and racists and everything and the world news shows that France is doing that to Muslims, but it's actually not true. France is mm -hmm. applying it to every religion. Even mm -hmm. Christians are not allowed to come to school with a cross. Mm -hmm. And nobody mentions that at all. Or you don't see Christians going crazy about it. 
And uh, I remember, I think in 2017 or, or to, I can't remember when, I came for vacation here in, in, in France and there was protests in Paris and it was Islamists in, in Paris who were protesting against the French. So basically what happened was there was an African family who was uh, mutilating their child. Mm. And their, their daughter, they were mm -hmm. doing the FGM. And the neighbor has called the police and the police showed up and the daughter was taken by child protective service. <clears throat> and the parents went to jail because it's illegal to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so all the Muslims got up and they said, you know, let us do what we're doing, which mm -hmm. is not true. You cannot do that. And I am very happy about that. And if I am ever asked to support that, I will be happy to do that. I love that story. That was like music to my ears because I am bombarded constantly with people telling me, obviously Canada is at the top of the list of trans aggressors. You've read my book. You know what happened to me um, when I went to my government looking for, for support in the UK. They have so many instances of FGM. And even though it's supposedly criminal, criminalized, not a single person has ever been prosecuted. Um, mm. Same thing in the States. Same thing in Australia. Same thing in so many Western countries that they have laws but when Muslims break the laws, they're like, uh, mm, and suddenly they have this leniency and uh, so they treat with your book, with your story. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. So perpetrators are treated differently depending on their ethnicity or their religion or there's all sorts of really crazy stories of people, you know, there is a. I, I, I haven't looked into this story, so I, I'm, I'm even afraid to say it because it sounds so crazy, but yeah. there was a, a man who raped a boy at a swimming pool. He was a Syrian refugee, and he said, I had to do it because it was a sexual emergency. Oh, my God. I mean, it, 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 it and he got, he didn't go to prison. And so it's just shocking the, the excuses that they make. I've seen excuses for men raping their wives and they say, oh no, but in my religion, I'm allowed to. And then they say, oh, okay. In his religion, he's allowed to. I don't right. care. Why do you yeah. care? Who yeah. cares? The, the, the laws of your country say that this is a criminal act. So therefore it is a criminal act. Who cares what is written in a 1400 year old book? I don't care. Absolutely. It is so infuriating. And I love to hear that in France, they're not buying it, that it's they're one not law buying for all. It. They are not buying it and they don't have the whole Sharia court. I mean, that oh, I yes. know of, because I looked up these things. I just checked and I just went online. I didn't really deeply go through it, but what I have seen, there is no Sharia court and they don't buy that. They just mm -hmm. don't. That's and great. I'm, I'm very happy about that because there is no such thing as religion. Like what happened to you that you were abused and a judge saw all your scars and simply said, it's your religion. I mean, that really does not make sense. I mean, no. so yeah, no, that does not. So far. That's wonderful. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. But One of yes, the most. There are. That there are some, uh, you know, Islamists who still think they can control you and everything. Yeah. So, for example, uh, I take French lessons. And uh, one time we had, because uh, France is taking uh, refugees from Syria. Mm. And there was uh, three girls from Syria who joined my French school. And they're all wearing their hijab. And uh, one of them... Um, I found myself one time after class was finished, I was standing outside waiting for my ride. And uh, she was standing next to me, chatting with me. And her husband came over to pick her up. And, you know, we quickly just said, hello, hi, Mishar, you know, and he left. 
And next morning, she said to me, my husband told me yesterday that he feels, he felt like you're a little too free. <laughs> and, and, you know, she paused for me to, to take it in. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and I was like, did he, like, feel it? Like, that's super cool. Did he, like, feel it? <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck does he think he is to make a judgment about your Absolutely. level of freedom? I mean, and, I, and I remember because it was winter, so I was wearing a jacket, so he did not really see anything, right? And I was like, oh, by the way, you also need to tell him that I have tattoos Good and that you. I drink and oh. that. I married a guy who's not Muslim. Does he know all this? Or did he just like assume? Because I really want her to go back home and tell him that. <laughs> Good for you. Oh, that's beautiful. It's like, oh, you, oh, was it too, you want me to show you freedom? <laughs> right? <laughs> show you you for it? What is that? <laughs> like, where do you think you are? This is not, it's like the same policing that was happening to you when you were growing up in Saudi Arabia with them coming in and talking Absolutely. to your family about music or whatever. They think they're going to continue that policing wherever they are in the world. Except oh. the difference is there. I could not say, screw you. Here yes. I can. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I am so glad that you got free, Michelle. I am so glad that you posted that video on Instagram. And I don't even know how I saw it, how it came across my feed. But that video... You know, first of all, it was just cinematically beautiful, your voice, your smile, everything about it, the, the, the you know, even the trees behind you and everything. It was just gorgeous. Thank you. But the fact that you made that video and posted it, I think there are few people that can understand how incredibly brave that was of you. Like. Yes. People see it and they think, oh, wow, this is a really nice video. It's nice for you to tell your story. But they don't get, like, this woman is a fucking warrior <laughs> to post this video. Like, it's just... Um, Thank you, Yasmin. I love you. <laughs> oh, I love you. I just, as soon as I saw that video, I was like, I need to know this woman. Because it's, it's <laughs> such a... It's such a gift to the world that there are women like you with that kind of strength and that kind of courage. And it's contagious. Your yeah. happiness, your good. freedom. I can see your freedom just as much as that guy could too. Like immediately. Right? It's so, <laughs> you radiate. <Yeah. laughs> you radiate. And, and that you, is Leslie. the whole purpose of this Forgotten Feminists you know, is I want to share people's stories and I want to inspire other people. I want to encourage other women to see like, I want that freedom too. I want to have a smile like Michelle's smile. Absolutely. Um, and now just the, 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 the cherry on top of this whole story is your, the man of your dreams that you married, who has the best job in the world, very smart woman for marrying him. Tell us about your, tell us about your Prince Charming. Uh, Francois is from uh, French and uh, I met him when I was working in Bahrain and uh, the funny story there is that um, I am sure you know about this uh, Yasmin in our society we a woman can never marry a man younger mm -hmm. than her mm -hmm. and in, there is absolutely no such case in every I case, did <laughs> Oh, but you're no, talking no. about... Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yes. okay. So, mm -hmm. because in our culture, that yeah. does not happen. No, you're right. And I remember um, he, he spoke with me and, and he told me how he felt. And I remember thinking, yeah, but you're younger than me. It, it, it just, I, I, I just, it just blurted out. <laughs> and he didn't care he was like so what I mean it's not like we're 20 years difference or something we're five years difference and to me I was like it doesn't make sense I mean your friends are gonna make fun of you your, your family are gonna make fun of you I mean you're gonna be a joke 
<laughs> and um, he just didn't care. I mean, age was the last thing. And then we happened and then we moved in really quickly. You know, we moved in together and then we got married. And then uh, seven years later, here we are building our own projects and life and everything, travel the whole world. And um, I remember when I met him, I was aware that he's not Muslim. And when he uh, proposed to me, I remember telling him, um, just at least like I need I need to say something to the people back home you know mm -hmm. so I was like so do you believe in God because back then you know now that I think about it they got to me just a little mm -hmm. and by they I mean Saudi Arabia and divorce right. and everything so I said to him so uh, give me something like do you believe in God and he said do you and I said yes and he said me too and then years later, one day we're just in a restaurant, they're just having a drink. And I was like, do you believe in God? And he said, do you? And, and I said, no. And he said, me neither. And I was like, that He's is such a man. cool <laughs> technique. I'm going to use that every time. Like when someone <laughs> says to me this, I'm going to be like, do you? Mm. I'm just going to believe in what you believe in. Like, <laughs> it's awesome. He didn't want it so, to be a deal breaker. He was afraid that you would run if he told you the truth. So he just perhaps, told you I what guess, you needed to know. hear. And the man is well, a pastry he's, chef. So he's a pastry chef. If you have to denounce Islam, <laughs> that's easy. You know, I see Paul oh, going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that that is amazing. Um, okay, so now I'm going to open it up to the rest of the group so that they can all ask you questions, share their stories. Um, Hi, guys. <laughs> you've got some chats there. You've got some messages from Sarah. Sahara is, uh, is also, oh, here she is. She just turned on her camera. She is such an amazing woman. You have to watch The Forgotten Feminists with her. I mean, talk about strength and bravery and courage and just just immensely phenomenal woman um, we, we so, spoke a little on instagram and oh, yes good. it's like her words are music to my ears it's yes. just incredible yeah yeah um so if anybody has any comments or questions for michelle please use the little hand up reaction or wave at me or turn on your microphone. Looks like Rena, you're first. Oh, thanks. Oh, Michelle, I just wanted, you know, like so many things I could say to you, but I've spent two years in Ghana, which was West Africa, and almost four in Saudi. So, you know, having been had the pleasure to do that, the, the chance to do that, I think we're all humans. There is only one God and God is goodness. So we should all get together pray whichever way we need to pray but more yes. important let's share our food and then dance there you go yes <laughs> and one more comment because i'm gonna let i want to hear other people is when i was showing my granddaughter's pictures from saudi the six-year-old said to me because we had talked about how hot it would be like 50 degrees sometimes right so she said that's not fair the men wear white and the women have to wear black she it's is absolutely so right. And and black attracts heat. Exactly. That's what she was saying. But to absolutely. hear from her it was amazing. How absolutely. It's not there. I remember I went to um because uh I we weren't strong in learning Islam at home, and my parents wanted us in, in uh summer schools in summer when, when there was vacation they wanted to enroll us in islamic schools and i remember when i would go there they wouldn't like the way i am dressed so they would add one more black layer on me from head to to toe and it would be so hot and i mean i remember i, I was discharged right away they were like you don't belong here and i was like yes <laughs> but i remember that it was so hot. I mean, I already had one and they were like, that's not enough. We can still see something. 
And I'm like, what could you possibly see? And they would cover me. And that was that was another story. So yeah. Where in answer. Saudi Arabia did you live, Rena? Where, where in Saudi? Where in Saudi? In Jeddah. Just outside, Jeddah. I worked just outside of Jeddah. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I got say stopped that. by the Mataba one time, the religious beliefs. I was downtown shopping and my, you know, head cover had fallen off. And this truck stops in front of me and went, cover your hair. Went, Pardon me? Cover your hair. Yes. Oh yeah, where is it? You know? Yes, absolutely. Oh. I, I have I have a story. The reason I left is because I was caught by them. But it was me and my sister and uh, two of my female friends. And we were in a car <clears throat> heading somewhere. And they just pulled over right in front of us and uh, we had a driver and uh, everyone I just need you to know when you have a driver in Saudi it does not mean you are rich it just means as a woman you cannot drive that's as simple as that because when I tell people in France I was with my driver they think mm -hmm. I am filthy rich and I'm mm -hmm. like no no that's not the case at all and so um, the Islamists stopped and they just pulled us out of the car and they put us in their car simply because one of our friends started talking back at them. And she was like, what do you want? And screw you guys. And that was a mistake, which I understand her. I totally do. And I remember that they put us in prison for four days and we were wow. out of reach for three days. Like our parents and our family did not know where we were. And that was the, the time that I, I thought I should leave because after coming out, I was depressed. I, 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 would have, I thought I had suicidal um, thoughts and, and I had stomach aches and I lost all of my hair. It was so scary. I wasn't even myself. And they can definitely ruin a girl's life. And like I said, they, they do a career out of it and they're really good at it. Why did yes. they pull you over? Like what, what, what were you charged with? Well, we were charged with uh, basically single girls going out without a male guardian. And uh, cherry on top is that I had a dog. So uh, in Islam, dog is considered a filthy animal and they don't like dogs. I mean, the fact that you are part of a religion that hates dogs, how is that not a red flag? Mm -hmm. Seriously, I mean, and so uh, it was a dog that my brother found in the desert when, when we were back in Saudi. I, I was 16 years old, I remember that. And it was my birthday. So he said to me, I found this from in the desert, it was alone and it's yours. And I loved dogs. So I kept it and I took good care of it. And he was a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. And they just took him and they just throw him in the desert. And they were telling me just to, that's how violent they are. You know, they, they just tell you words that are so hateful. And they just said, we're, we're going to throw him in, in the desert and he's just going to starve to death and he's going to die of thirst. And looking at your pet in the eyes was trying to crawl back oh at you. God. It was such a terrible, terrible incident. And I wrote a book about that. And my film is also about that. Oh, I can't so, even imagine. It's terrible. I mean, these, these people, and they did whatever they are doing is completely legal. And they get paid for that by the government. The government gives them cars, phones, everything, and, and commissions for whatever they do that. I mean, it's like they're being commissioned for ruining a girl's life. You know, they, they get applauded for that. And when you live in a community like that, it really, 
it ruins you. I'm, I am glad that you've shared this story because for anybody watching, I want them to understand, you know, when we, when we're fighting for our rights and when we speak up against these things, often we are silenced by all sides and we're attacked and we're being told you're exaggerating and, you know, things like that. And when we're silenced by Islamists, that's one thing because they're following their ideology and they were indoctrinated into that. But when we're silenced by people in the West, people who can ride in the car with their friends without ever giving it a second thought, people who can have a dog without ever giving it a second thought, people who can ride their bikes without giving it a second thought, people who can wear whatever clothing they want to wear without ever giving it a second thought, Absolutely. are trying to silence us. The amount of privilege and just cluelessness that they're living in and, and the, the entitlement that they think that they have to tell us to be quiet and for us to not share our traumas, I want them to understand how something as simple as riding in the car with your friends or having a dog as a pet is, is considered crime. criminal activity. You go to prison for it. A teenager thrown in prison over these crimes and your family doesn't even know where you are for three days. I mean, they must have just been absolutely beside themselves with worry. I meant to ask you. They were calling hospitals and they were trying to find us. And Nobody it was your, cared. your sister and your brother. So it was like, no, it, it was, was just your sister, me, my sister yeah. and yeah. two female friends. Yeah. So two of their daughters just disappeared one night. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I was going to ask yeah. you how you got to travel because I know that they have so such restrictions. I mean, you talked about restrictions for driving, but obviously restrictions for travel as well. But this Absolutely. was the this was the impetus for you to get out. Uh, well, so when that happened, like I said, I, I had this depression that really hit me and, and I, I just could not, even my family could not recognize who I am. And I remember uh, where I worked, they were opening a, um, a branch in Bahrain, which was the neighboring country. So by, that was 2014. And uh, so where I worked, uh, like I said, I, I, I knew that they were going to open another branch. And I thought, instead of just ending all of this, I just want to give life one last chance. Just mm. one. It's incredible. Yes, I mean, when I think about it now, it's so scary. When I see what I have now, I'm thinking, and, and I read the same about your book. You wanted to end it, and you actually tried and it, it made me cry when I see you today. I'm like, you could have missed all of this. And so I thought I should give life one chance. And I remember I picked up my laptop and I sent an email to the general manager of the hotel. And the email wasn't like applying for a job. It wasn't even professional. It was like a girl crying for help. Mm -hmm. So I basically explained to him that what happened and then I said to him um, I want to go to Bahrain and I literally want to do anything I mean it doesn't matter a promotion or I don't care I just want to get out and he sent me an email saying just come over to my office and let's just talk and I had no idea what was that could he say I'm sorry about what happened to you, but I'm not gonna take you there. Or could it mean, yeah, let's go. And I went there and I remember every colleague of mine were looking at me differently because I was caught by the Islamists. Mm. It means I'm not a good girl. I made 
a mistake, you know? I'm like disowned from everyone. And I was so uncomfortable leaving the house. And that was the first time I left the house ever since the incident happened. And I remember I sat with him and I just, I just talked to him. And I think when I told him about my dog, that's mm. when he, he couldn't, he just, because he, I remember he met my dog oh. and he couldn't believe that humans took a dog and hurt him. So a few days later, he sent me a message and he said, we're packing, we're getting the hell out. <laughs> oh. Is your general manager Saudi? No, he was from the States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, Bro, I remember it's a bit more red purple. Yes. Yeah, turn on your oh. microphone or unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, no, we can't hear you. Oh, wait. Yeah, we can't hear you. Maybe I'm oh, just no. happy. Oh, perfect. Yes, I was <laughs> having issues. But um, my name used to be Roa. Now it's Leora after I left Islam. But uh, I used to work with her in the same, in the same uh, office. And then she was just behind me. Yes. And, you know, Mishar, I never knew what happened with you. <laughs> yes, she was this person I really look up to because uh, I'm Sudanese and she's Somalian and uh, she was always this happy person in the office right and I looked up to her and because I was going through a lot in my life I would say one day I want to be like Mishai right <laughs> <laughs> you would not want to be me <laughs> no, you were you had your own personality, you know? You I were, actually, when I think about it now. Yeah, I can look at the person and see that how, how strong she, she is, right? And she would always uh, have, prank everyone in the office. She's <laughs> always happy and smiling. And one day uh, I realized that you're not there. And because I was so, uh, I was going through a lot. I'm not the kind of person who would ask twice uh so she suddenly she disappeared she didn't come to work and she's always early with me I would, <laughs> we're in the office early and i asked her and i said oh where's mishar how is she doing and everyone would say just oh she's she's just sick and i, I never asked i never asked again um until when she came back she came back a whole different person mm -hmm. i couldn't she didn't even smile <laughs> I looked at a person and I said, no, that's not someone who's just sick. Mm. But I still didn't ask anyone else. But it was within me. I knew that what, whatever happened to you has nothing to do with you being sick. And then I only found out about what happened with the, I call them haram police. Mm. I don't call them haya. <laughs> and I just found out recently when I, when I read your book. And now I know the story. Too. They they did a they did a good job hiding it and uh, yeah. they they would hide it as if it was the biggest crime yeah. and you know they I remember the HR sat with me and they said to me you can't come here you you can't come back here we can't let people find out what you did and I. <laughs> But here's the thing that's really interesting, Yasmin. I don't know how, but the Islamists have got through my life. They called my family and they called my work and they told them things, which uh. is until today, I don't know what it is. So my parents who were loving and caring and supportive, when I came out, they were completely different people. They signed up with them. They signed with them. And it really broke my heart that my parents were just like, they're right. What were you doing out there? Yeah. And it's incredible when you think about those things. Like, you are a criminal. I mean, and for what? I'm trying to search. What did I do? 
And uh, it was definitely the, the one thing, I mean, they've, they've broken me, honestly. I think their main mission was to make me an, an Islamist, a, a this, this person who believes in Islam. And that was, that was their mission. They just wanted that. And it just couldn't resonate with me. And I am a when I was a child, I could make mistakes. Like I would get caught listening to music. And you know, as a child, you don't, you just don't stop. So I used to have my own Walkman and I used to have my own headphones and they would just break it and tear it. It was so scary. And I would just watch them and they would like hit me or, or scream at me. And I remember as a kid, I was so scared of humans that my first crush ever was the teapot from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> 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 and I was worried about myself. <laughs> that was my first crush. A freaking <laughs> teapot. <laughs> Well, she was and weary. She's a really those... nice teapot. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then later on, that was fixed, thank God. But yeah, no, uh, I, I was so scared of people. I really was. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to be in trouble all the time. And I would always be like, I would like to apologize for the behavior of my passion. I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I apologize that I have critical thinking skills. I apologize that I have a personality. I have apologized that I have interests. Or passion. Or, or passions, yeah. You were saying that the Masher that you knew before had disappeared. Um, so... What about the Michelle that you see today? Has she come back? Is this your friend now? I'm glad she come back. And actually we became, for me, I, I formed this connection with her after she moved out, out of the country. Cause I moved out of the country after that as well. I did the same thing. Um, but it really, it's freeing to see her like that. And it makes me happy to see her back, honestly. Um, that's so it. tell me, am I a little too free? <laughs> you have to be free. <laughs> you have to be free. free. And, and sorry to share this story, but about even about um, about the music part, I, I love music. I love listening to music all the time. And sometimes we're not allowed, they say, you're not allowed to listen to music when you're in the shower, taking a shower, because it's it's haram in Islam. Yes. And they're saying the, the, the jinn might enter your body and control you so well. So the other day I was just listening to music. Every time I, I put on the music, I remember when my family used to just knock on the door and scream at me. I get hit sometimes for doing that. But here I, would, I was listening to music and it just hit me. It hits you sometimes. Like when you, mm -hmm. when you leave the country and you're free, you just, you're just happy because you're free. And That's then after so that, you have to go through the healing process because you have these flashbacks that you, you just, it, it, it takes you somewhere, right? Yes. So I, I went inside the washroom, I was taking a show and I was listening to music and then it hit me and I cried. Mm -hmm. When I came outside and when I was, I was talking to my husband, I told him, do you know that in Islam there, you're not supposed to listen to music inside the washroom? And every time yeah, I anyway. talk, he just, he's shocked. Really? Yeah. Why is it like that? You know? <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really glad to see you, to see you happy and, and free. Thank you. You too. You too. Speaking of uh, uh, trauma and, and going back there, um, I remember when I came to France, people would tell me um, when I would ask about your opinion, what shall we do? People would always say, you do what you like or you do what you want. And I slowly realized when, when you are born in Saudi, you do not decide anything. 
Nothing. Anything, everything mm -hmm. is decided for you. The school you go to, the friends you hang out with, the, the houses you sleep or, 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 or hang out with, um, the, the sports you play, I guess, if there is any, and uh, the jobs you, you apply for in university, the major you, you, and the degree that you have to take, the man you marry, how many kids you should have, and the names of the kids. I mean, mm -hmm. even the government, when you think about it, here, there is some kind of an election and debate and you get to decide who do you want to, 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 to um, um, vote for. Mm -hmm. and, and you live with that decision. Now, I know the, the system here is broken. Don't worry, I know about you Western people, you're also suffering in your own way. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying is that you make a decision and you live with it. So when I came to France, I am telling people, what do you think? Shall we do that? And they're like, do you want to do that? And I find myself overwhelmed mm -hmm. because now I have to make all of these decisions. And it's also another liberating thing. It's simple, but it's empowering. Absolutely. Every single aspect of your life. I mean, Leora was talking about the, the gin that live in the bathroom and why you have to enter the bathroom with your right, is it with your right foot? I forgot you guys, with your right foot. And then you say, like, please don't possess me, <laughs> demons, you know, right. Like everything. And then when you leave the bathroom, you leave with your left foot. And when you put on your shoe, you put it on your your right foot first and yeah it was always start with the right or something control. like that yeah you pick up your and you put them on you have to say the prayer too because yep. the gin are in the room <laughs> the gin are there. yes and it's just you, everything that you said is true about you know who you marry and all that stuff but even the minutia even the smallest little aspects of your life you're absolutely correct I had no idea how to make decisions. That was probably the hardest part for me was because I was, yeah. everything was decided for me. And suddenly I had to choose. I'm like, how do you even? Overwhelming. Begin? Yeah. Very. Yeah. It's funny. I actually never learned the whole Islamic thing, you know, with the right and left and everything. That's another thing. My parents tried again in a when it was summer again they tried to enroll me in a school another islamic school and i remember my mom said um so when you go there you never mention that you're somali and the reason is because these islamic um, schools they the the chairs are reserved for locals the registration and then mm -hmm. when they think they have enough then they enroll the minorities or other nationalities so, and I was not aware of any of that until my mother said, just remember, do not mention you're Somali. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to school and during registration, I just voluntarily blurted it out because I wanted to be kicked out. So I was like, by the way, I mean, she was like, what is your name? And I was like, just so you know, I am from Somalia. And My she name was like, yeah, Somalia, Somalia, Somalia. Somali. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I remember coming back home and looking, looking my mom in the eyes and telling her she asked me where I was from. I, I, I can literally tell you, but she didn't care. So yeah, luckily Smart. I never really learned those things. But you see, that's what I'm saying, Yasmin. That's why people would come over to our house and then they would see those mm. wrong things and they would manipulate my parents. Like, no, no one's gonna marry your daughters or they're gonna die alone. And I would just be like, you know, at least worst case scenario, I have a teapot, you know? Like, I am fine <laughs> for life. <laughs> I do not. I'm not worried, <laughs> but that wasn't the case for my parents. So it sounds like your parents are pretty open-minded, except for, of course, them believing the religious police. That must have been devastating for you. Um, but how did they, have you ever told them that you've denounced Islam? Have, have, how did they react to that? Or have you never had that conversation? Oh, no, I have not. 
-hmm. if I ever want to kill them, I can just say that. Yeah. But yeah. no, I have not tell them that. Uh, so yes, my parents are very religious. But you see, when I see our friends, uh, their parents would tell them, you have to pray. And you mm -hmm. have to pray in front of me. They will like supervise them. But see, we didn't have those things at home. My parents were just incredibly scared of people's judgment. Yeah. And people would do a really good job doing that. I mean, yeah. it would be so easy. You just walk into a house, you already see a radio and you're like, you have a radio in your house? And then you see your dog and then that's it. it that's a done deal. That's like, mm. that's like no. it. No angels and, are and, gonna go you know, in your house it, now. Exactly, that's, it's like things like that. So, mm. and, and they would just get really angry and they would be like, that's it. You know, let's turn off the TV. Let's all start being religious. And normally that will last for like a couple of hours, but then it would just never end. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in reading your book and you haven't mentioned to me that you had a book. So can you tell me the title of your book now so that anybody else who's interested in reading it can also get it? Yes, currently it's in French. Oh, okay. I'll and uh, it's called uh, Soif de Vivre, which means mm. thirsty for life. The life. Oh, yes I love that and, title right <laughs> thirsty for life yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. but English will be coming out soon okay wonderful and you'll let me know as soon as the English is out please yeah and I, I can't wait to share that yes. um so is there anybody else that had any questions for Michelle before we wrap up Paula sent a message. Is it possible that I read very weird news like French doctors will not rebuild the vagina of non-virgin Muslim women? Why? What's that? Yes, Paula. So uh, in Islam, uh, when a woman gets married, she should be virgin. And uh, a lot of women who are not virgin they go to hospitals and they get an operation to get that done. And uh, I don't know how that's possible to even make it, but it happens. And yes, in France, that does not exist. You simply cannot do that because if the guy who wants to marry you finds out you're not a virgin, I'm sorry, but he can go fuck himself. <laughs> Love it. So there you go. Simple <laughs> yeah. as that, right? <laughs> Beautiful. Sahara, were you about to? Yes, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Hi, guys. I am so wow. What an amazing. I was laughing and, you know, my camera on and off. Mashar, we are so proud of you. Congratulations for your uh, freedom. Thank You're you. truly a fighter, freedom fighter, you know. And um, yeah, it's it's so interesting, you know, the, the people in 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 France, in, in France, the country you at right now, these crazy morons telling you that you are you are too much free is like it's it's just insane, you know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and and also I want to talk about because I am also um, I was born in Somalia, even though I don't know anything about that. I call it a shithole because that country still is a shithole. Um, you know, they can't get their shit together. You know, the, the thing is, they can't get their shit together because the interesting thing, the Somali people are one language, one nation, um, one, you know, uh, nationality, but they fight in each other. They fight in each other. And you know, the reason is tribalism and racism does exist within the Somali community and also Arab world and Africa, but they don't want to talk about real oppression and racism does exist in the African country that I grew up because I remember when I was growing up uh, in Kenya because I was born in Somalia and then the civil war happened in 1991. I was a baby and then we flee from Somalia, came to Kenya, so I don't know any Thing about Somalia but I do know Kenya so when I was growing in Kenya I remember this um, my this um, group of people they they were called Bantu I don't know if you know Bantu people have you heard Bantu people uh, Bantu? minority Somali 
Bantu, yes. No. No, you don't know Bantu because probably you didn't grow up in a majority uh, Somali community or Somali, you know. But mm -hmm. these Bantu, they are Somali. So they are minority though. They, the majority of Somali, Somali people don't marry the Bantu. So the Bantu people are, they have a, their own culture. They're still Muslim. So they, they still practice Islam. They speak Somali, but they have a different dialogue. They do, they do speak something uh, Bantu dialogue. So I remember when I was a little girl, these uh, community or this group, they were not married by the majority of Somali people. They were looked down as they weren't part of the Qabil. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know if you know Somali words, but Qabil mm -hmm. is yes. a tribalism, oh, right? Really that, shit, that shit, because that garbage, they still get, not getting along with each other because that shit. So the Qabil is when you're Somali, you have to marry your own Qabil, which I never subscribed that. So for me, I was the odd one because I didn't have a Qabil. I didn't subscribe Qabil because I'm just a human being, I'm Sahara. And I just never fit the a Somali description card. To be Very Somali, good. I yeah, to be Somali, there's a special card. It's not a credit card, unfortunately. I could have bought <laughs> something. But it's a it's card okay. that, you, yeah, it's a card that you have to fit to, to be part of the community. And I was never, and I believe probably um, Ayan too. I know Yasmin mentioned Ayan, yes. um, you know. So when this card is like, you have to be a good Somali girl, you have to have your tribe. You have to ha know your Qabil. I never, I never subscribed Qabil because I thought if Allah was, you know, created all of us and why do we need a Qabil? And I just treated everybody okay, but no, you have to have a Qabil. And I didn't have a Qabil because I didn't subscribe that nonsense, you know, shit. So then I was called Midgan. I don't know if you know that word Midgan. No. Probably you don't. Do you speak Somali language? I do. Okay, so Midgan is basically the person who does who don't have um, who don't uh, have a tribe or who doesn't have a qabil. I mean, you do probably I do have a qabil somewhere. Probably I just don't subscribe. It's a nonsense. It's a shit. It's just a division, right? I don't buy the qabil things. I it just see people like the, as human beings. Does it? It sounds sort of like the caste system in India. Caste, is that correct? Yeah, a caste, okay. caste, caste. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's also. Yasmin, yes, isn't it an Arabic word, um, Qabil, which is tribalism? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because in yeah. Muhammad, he thought Islam, there's a Qabil, correct? Yeah. Yeah. In Islamic. Yes. This is an Arabic word. Yeah. Yeah, but the Somali. Yeah, the Qabil, yeah, but the Somali people do use it a lot. Okay. So then going back mm -hmm. to these band too, uh, my neighbors, I remember they were not married. And then I asked her the question because, you know, I, my aunt raised me, so I said to my aunt, why are we not married this, uh, you know, this, this group? And then she said, we, they are different. They're not Somali. They are Bantu. So I remember Somali people only marry within their tribalism and with their whatever class, and, and you didn't marry outside. But that, that world for me, I never subscribed. I was the different. I got beat up. So I wanted to ask you, did you get beat up when you ask a question such as, I don't know, I know you grew up in the Middle East. I grew up in Kenya uh, and probably you have seen um, racism because racism does exist. They just don't talk about it. You know, it's within it and it's just, it's, it's normalized, you know, it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, so did you get beat up? Because as a girl, Somali girl, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you are growing up or if you're not a growing up, you're going to get beat up. Like qara. You know what qara means? No. Uh, okay. So be, so did you get beat up when you were growing up? Questioning. Um, yes. Yes, I did. But this is the thing that hurts me. It wasn't my parents. The oh, people okay. who beat me up would be my teachers over really stupid things that I did or said. And my parents would just sit by and be like, what did you do to deserve that? And when I would tell them, they would just think it's good that someone did that. And it would really, really bother me. I mean, in class, like I remember my, I had an Islamic teacher and he is the main reason I hated Islam. If that man thought he was going to make me a Muslim, 
he did a terrible, terrible job. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, I'm reading Erkan's uh, comment. Jin is a real spirit, but just. <laughs> Well, we can't read it. Again? It's a private message. <laughs> I don't Tell know us what it is. <laughs> just, it went. The... Oh, God. I want to know what it says. <laughs> what did you say, Erica? You got to do for everybody. We can't. So we have to read it. <laughs> Please read said, that to the whole class. <laughs> I know. I said, Jin is a real spirit, but the Jin is not. Oh, oh Jin okay. is <laughs> <laughs> Bravo! The gym behind you is real. <laughs> yeah, the gym oh, let's, let's, let's get back to um, you, Sarah. <laughs> it's so, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. Um, like, yeah. So, I used to have this teacher who was really just... He was just violent. And I think he actually... Personally, he did not like me, mm -hmm. I guess, because I would dare to do stuff like listen to music. And I would also dare to ask questions. Like, for example, um, mm -hmm. I never forget the story about uh, Adam and Eve when he taught us about Adam and Eve. And then I remember he just switched to, to Eve and he was like, that's why all women are going to go to hell. And the majority fitna. of women are fitna. fitna. Mm. Yes, exactly. And he would say, you know, women started out by making a sin, by, by taking an apple and eating it. And as a child, I was, I would just blurt out questions without thinking twice. And I remember saying to him, so was this apple like really important to God? Like, was he saving it for later? Was that <laughs> the last apple? I mean, was it? I mean, he's supposed to be God. I am sure he's gonna make another. Not another. <laughs> right? And he's he making seventy-two me. apples. I think he's <laughs> ran out of. I mean, think about it. And and even I wanted to add, like now that I think about it, I was like, so did you guys ever think about how men have this thing on their throat Adam's that apple. says, "Yeah, Adam's that. apple." Like, they hate it. <laughs> But that's not the point now. So mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. asking this question, like, was it so important that he had to do that? And he went crazy. And he mm -hmm. just wanted to make me an example. Yeah. And he hit me. And I remember I went home and I could still, I still had his um, fingers on, on my face. And my face that's was swollen. And my dad picked me up. My dad will always pick me up from school. And he said, what happened? And I told him that apparently we're not supposed to talk about that apple. No. <laughs> and when I explained to him, my father just went, yeah, well, you know, you're not supposed to ask questions. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how I learned. You're not supposed to ask questions. But, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's the control, the whole community, even like, uh, you know, but I got beat up from my parents because I escaped in the middle of the night for myself to for for my freedom. Uh, so beating is normal, you know. Beating a uh, girls, especially uh, the the girls, do get more beaten than the world where I grew up. So you just get hit yes. by questioning or just going to a neighbor's or just not wearing the right hijab or just yes. just, just asking a simple question. It, and then also on top of that is the community. The policing within the Somali community is very bully. I, I know you didn't grow up, but I remember even just coming here, bro, like coming to United States and like your, your experience really is so relatable because I came to America not speaking English as well. So I was mm -hmm. looking with my eyes and I'm just like, holy cow, they can wear short. These people are okay. I was in a different universe, just like when you went to France, you know? So, and then, of course, the people here, the Somali or the Muslims, who wants to, oh, you sister, you need to wear the hijab, or you need to do this, or you need to, you know, be part of the tribalism. And I'm like, I left that shit. Why do you have to bring that shit in here? You know, yeah. that's the things I escaped from. So yeah. it's interesting. Um, the reason I brought out the Bantu people is very fascinated when Somali people come to the Western world when we are so racist toward, toward each other, and especially we are so racist. And I, I really believe 
there was slavery. And I, I really think, of course, Somali people were enslaved by the Middle East, but also they did enslave other Black Africans. So the Bantu people, I believe, is from, and I'm doing really writing my book and this uh, looking up their history. They are from um, either Kenya or some, you know, they from Africa, but these people were taken from their, uh, their country, taken to back to Somalia, and they were enslaved too. So th these uh -huh. are the uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversation. We don't want to talk about the issues and the, you know, things that still exist. I remember back home still even, I left, to, I left to Kenya 2000, 2006, 06. It's still those, you know, these barbaric is still being practiced. You can't marry Bantu people. But then you come here, we have somebody like Ilhan Omar, you know, coming here and running with her victim uh, racism card, which she was never enslaved. She probably, we enslaved people back home, you know? So she was never a slave. So she comes to the Western world. We come to the Western world. I'm not talking about the people who wants to live normal, but I'm talking about the people who are driving this narrative about racism. When our own community, we are so racist toward each other. We don't even marry okay. them to people because we are so racist and because we don't think they are the same as Somali people, the majority yeah. of Somali people. And when I brought up those conversations, even when I was in the religion, I was in the in in the community in the in this ideology. I was called. I was with Gan. I was not part of the you know the whatever they want me to be part of it. So we have to be honest. And and these people are just incredible. You know how they just come, complain, complain when their own freaking community, little girls in in the United States right now, little yeah. girls are being cut every day, female genital mutilation. They don't want to talk about this is happening in the Western world and it's disgusting. And, and you're going to talk about racism. So these people are unbelievable. And that's why I just recently wrote a letter to Ilhan Omar with her Islamophobia, you know, bill she's passing. And, and this is a whole world, you know, the whole throughout the world is going to affect that you can't speak about Islam. It's all about silence and people like us. It's not about protecting any, anything. That Absolutely. bill would not protect little girls getting their clitoris cut up every freaking day. So I am yeah. just so proud of you. I just want to say thank you for sharing your voice. Sorry, I rant. But Yasmin, also, thank you for giving the silent voices to, uh, you know, a platform where they can tell their story. Uh, and we are unstoppable. We are the tsunami, as they say. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we're not going to stop. And we're going to just keep speaking. And I love you, girls. And you're just amazing. So oh. thank you. Thanks for letting oh, me know. You too. <laughs> yeah. Peace to no, everybody. We're going we're gonna to keep speaking and we're going to be an army where yep. Muslims will be so scared of us and they're going to look yep. at us and they're going to say, we can't win this. That mm -hmm. is the mission. I mean, when I see, when I scroll down the page of, um, of uh, Yasmin and I saw these amazing, beautiful women. Mm -hmm. I couldn't watch the videos, I wanted to see them, but I read the profiles. And I, I, I wanted this to be the longest page available. Mm -hmm. And I want them to be scared and think, we can't do this, we can't win this. And I have, I have hope now more than ever mm -hmm. when I see all of us. Yes, mm -hmm. they can't silence us. And Yasmin said earlier, the earlier uh, she said it about the clueless and the ignorance, privileged people who, because we get, do get canceled. I do get canceled just for saying like, dude, I'm not oppressed. America is not oppressing me, you freaking, freaking people. Sorry, I have to use my freaking, freaking. Uh, these people are insane. Like, do you care about people? go look in the community what's happening to little girls you know getting child marriage even happening here in the united states and you know they 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 just they cuddle with islam they just this ideology is so fascinating it's the only ideology that gets a free pass it comes to islam everybody just gets in their corner something yeah. is just so interesting because i went to university here and when i you know start speaking about this thing I was called Islamophobe, even though I was wearing freaking fucking hijab. I was still wearing the hijab, but I was Islamophobe somehow. 
-hmm. you know, it, it's bullshit. It's to silent us, but we have a story. Every human being has a story and we're going to speak out and we're going to, they can't silent us. We are unsilenced and we are unstoppable. And, and thank you for all of you sharing your story because stories like yours and Yasmin and Ayan, you know, girls who can, we give hope. And it's going to be okay. You can leave Islam. You can say no, no to Momo if you want to. So that's all. <laughs> Very nice. And, and remove well, your hijab. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Thanks, yeah. I, I just want to, yes. Thank you so much, Sahara. Just want to say one more thing before we let Lois ask her question. Is I wanted to say that, first of all, they are already concerned with the amount of ex-Muslims that are out there that are speaking mm -hmm. up. Because we have social media, we have the internet, so they can't keep us quiet anymore. Yeah. Voices are coming out of Iran and Saudi Arabia yeah. and Pakistan and Afghanistan and everywhere in the world, and you cannot yeah. silence us anymore. Yeah. Not just in the West, but anywhere. Anybody yes. can make an account, share their pictures, share their stories, and so the world is getting to know. And also information is flowing in. So when you're living in these Muslim majority countries, you're given one, one hymn book, right? You're given the Quran, you're, whether it's in your education, whether it's in your government, whether it's in media, it's all singing the same tune. And suddenly when you have the internet, you're getting all sorts of different music that you can get access to, all sorts of different narratives, all sorts of different ideas, and suddenly people are starting to recognize how ridiculous it is that we're following this religion of a man who had hallucinations in a cave 1400 years ago. And still girls are being mutilated, girls are being forced into marriages. I mean, girls are being forced into hijab where they're being thrown into prison. I mean, the, the, it's endless what they're still murdering people for being gay because yes. of this person that had a psych, you know, a psychotic break in a cave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing I wanted to say was your story, Mashir, of this Islamic teacher, that story is repeated over and over and over and over and over again. And it was the first chapter in my book. The way they whip us and the way they punish us, the way the religious police were beyond inhumanly vicious to your dog, do they really think that's going to endear us to Islam? Don't they know that go. they're pushing people away? Like when your Quran teacher is, is, is a madman, is a violent madman, do you think that's going to make kids love the Quran and, and, and want to study it and want to pray? Of course we're going to hate it. You are doing it. You are pushing people out of Islam. And then when they try to leave, you say, well, now we can kill you because now your blood is halal. But people are, yes. we're used to fear. You put fear in us from the minute we were born. And so we don't care yeah. anymore. We've always, always lived in fear. That was my constant state. I was in a constant state of fear. So now you're threatening my life. Well, what else is new? I'm used to that. I'm used to being scared. And so yeah. really there's, they taught us not to value life. They taught yes. us that this world is not important. And now they're saying, well, we're going to kill you. Well, you already taught me that this world is important. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you put that you exactly. created the soldier that I am today. And so this is, this is your doing. Actually, at some stage in my life, weird, but I wanted to go to hell. Because when I would see the amount of people who's supposed to be in heaven, mm -hmm. and they would tell me, for example, all these Christians and all of these, because, you know, I loved music. So they would always tell me stuff like, you will go to hell with them. You're so like, you would go along okay. with them. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, you know what? Free concerts. I mean, <laughs> you will. <laughs> and here I am. Free concert. <laughs> Partying my ass off while uh, you're what? <laughs> Having sex with some angel virgins? I mean, yeah, in a river of buttermilk <laughs> and with honey. <laughs> why, halal, why, is, halal. why is this enticing? <laughs> I mean, how bad exactly in hell with Bowie and Lennon? How cool awesome. is that? Yeah, unbelievable. 
I mean, what's yeah. the worst that could happen? A, a beer <laughs> that was sitting out for like a couple of days? If that is the worst, that's totally <laughs> fine. And then, you know, they would try and tell me these stories, you know, this and that, it's going to happen to you. And I'm like, yeah, 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 but is, you know, Backstreet Boys going to be there? Because that's that was my jam back in those days. <laughs> of course. And, and I would be like, yeah, yeah, sk skip to the good part. I mean, Mother Teresa is going to be there. I mean, we're going to be, what are you talking about here? <laughs> I have a party, a hell of a party. <laughs> so I really, I literally accepted I know. to be in hell. I was fine with that. I was like, just leave me alone. But that's the thing. They tell you that if your child is not a good Muslim, it's not just his choice. You all go to hell. And that yes. is a very smart thing. They yes. tell you if one person is doing this, you all go together. So now yes. everybody goes against you. They all unite because they all want to be in heaven with all those losers <laughs> i'm too cool for heaven <laughs> None of, we're all too cool for heaven we're Lois. too cool for heaven <laughs> you're like making an album that fits that well i well back to well you're basically talking about the way that western uh western liberals don't well, they should be embracing you and they should be taking up your cause according to their supposed principles. And I'm wondering if some part of this whole thing is they can't comprehend that anybody could possibly believe this extreme religion. They can't believe that they really believe it and it can't possibly be what you're saying it is. And I say that because, well, Yasmin knows that I'm an ex-fundamentalist. I was raised a fundamental Christian. And I do understand. I've seen extreme beliefs that are absurd. Yeah. And so ex-fundamentalists do understand, but people that have never been deeply entrenched in any any fundamental religion just have trouble believing that, mm -hmm. that there are people that genuinely do believe it. Do you yeah. think that is involved in it at all? Uh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> they are so much in their world that they actually believe they are going to make the whole world Muslim. I mean, I used to hear that when I would pass by uh, on Fridays, you would have this imam who after prayer, he would just take the mic and just talk about how Israel and everything and this and that. And he would say our aim is to go out there in the world and make everyone Muslim like the prophet did because the prophet apparently he took a sword and he killed everyone and he said, I am forcing you to be Islam, a Muslim and we should all do that. And that's why all of these terrorist attacks are happening. I mean, I don't know, but I think that's one of it. But, but Western, the, the Western liberal, uh, the one, the people that have never been exposed to any fundamentalist religion. I mean, they see it around them, but it is not real to them. And they cannot believe that they think, well, it, they don't really believe that there's some other reason. There's something else that they're, that's causing these things that, that nobody could possibly believe this. Absolutely. Even we don't thing. believe this and we are from there. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yasmin is the same, uh, Sahara is the same, and, and Diora is the same. We're all thinking, this is not right, and we are from there. So I can totally understand if you cannot comprehend this. Mm -hmm. And by so, the way, you, <laughs> one prophet uh, had hallucinations in a cave. Well, I understand that the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the Christian New Testament, had epileptic seizures. Mm. And everything he wrote was because of what he saw in epileptic seizures. Did he ever fly on a winged mule that had the face of a woman? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is a plausible story, right? And, and then oh, while yeah. he was flying, that's where he saw all the women in hell being hung by their hair because they were enticing men, yeah. you know? And then he split the moon in half, although that was a different day. Like, it just absolutely ludicrous things and mm -hmm. and the fact 
and it's, it's like, okay, you want to have your irrational thoughts or your irrational beliefs or your irrational fairy tales. That's fine. But my problem is that these irrational stories cause such harm. Yes, They're yes. so violently, hatefully cruel to people today. Like, please yes. just believe that stuff over there in your home with the door shut fine. You know, people believe all sorts of crazy stuff. That's their business. But, but the fact that it's in laws, it's in government, yeah. and it is causing so much chaos on this planet. And you know what? They're killing each other more than anything anyway. Like, I, I don't know if you guys saw recently um, in Afghanistan, where there was, was it, or Pakistan, where Sunnis killed Shias in a Shia mosque and like, 200 of them were injured or something. He went in there with a with a suicide vest because that's what they do. They even kill each other for not being yeah. Muslim enough. So imagine what they're going to yeah. do to the non-Muslims, yes. you know? Absolutely. Less than cockroaches. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's the same in Saudi. They have the whole difference between Sunni and Shia. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I learned about that, I was 15 or 16, I can't remember. And there was a girl who came over to me and said to me, so are you Sunni or Shia? And I remember thinking, you know, I can barely be Muslim. I cannot go to another, <laughs> this is already enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I went back home and I said to my parents, well, what does that mean? And they said the same thing. They said, you know, that's, that's a completely different thing. We can't get into it. Let's just deal with this now. And then deal with the rest. So I still don't know whether I am any, it's too late, of course. But I mean, I still don't know which was I. <laughs> Even Sufis sometimes. Yes, there's, you're Sufi, right. There's Sufi, which is Lebanese. There is, there is also ah, Nadi. They get, they get yeah. ashamed. For, my father was a Sufi. And then when they moved, when they moved to Saudi, because everyone in Saudi, in Saudi is Sunni Wahhabi, they would feel ashamed to say, oh, I'm, 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 from, I'm Sufi, right? So they will just say, oh, I'm Sunni Wahhabi, the same way. So just brainwash you like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Northern Ireland, the Catholics and Protestants were ready to kill each other at one point. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that's gone, but, uh, oh, it's absurd. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have gone way over time, but Erkan, I will let you be the last but not least question, please. Okay, thanks. And I'll try to make it brief. Uh, <laughs> thanks uh, again for a great talk, um, Nashir. Um, I was thinking about, because people were talking in the conversation about um, absurdities and like things like that. And, I, and it made me think about that, that kind of mantra, you know, that comes from uh, Tertullian, um, I think, or Augustine. You know, I believe, I, I, be, I believe not what is absurd, but because it is, obs it, it is absurd. And that's kind of one of the mantras of religion, isn't it? If you think about it, like a believer is prepared to mm. even demonstrate that they are oh. completely nonsensical, you know, um, right. they're, they're pr to, to demonstrate their, their level of, um, you know, the, one of the requirements. Yeah, yeah. What, to, yeah, they're kind of gullibility if you like not, never but, thought about it that way yeah and yeah. there's a kind of there's an old mantra yeah that, that, that kind of i think richard dawkins has written about it and a few others as well but it's yeah. part of the sort of requirement that, and if you think about it it's it, it's part of it, a lot of ideological movements where they you know whether we're talking political movements or whatever but people you prepare to accept things without evidence you prepare to accept increasingly bizarre statements and increasingly and it's one of the great evils, actually, of, of I think, of kind of dogmatism and ideology, you know. I, I believe it because it is absurd, you know. That's one of the things that underpins kind of religious That's brilliant. Kind of ideological I, mindset. I never yeah. thought about it that way. I mean, when I hear people talking and saying things like that, I look at them and I'm like, you realize you look ridiculous right now, right? But they don't have that shame or I look stupid or whatever coming out of my mouth is weird. No, they do not hold back. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. exactly. Sorry to add, but because in the Muslim world, we start with children from a younger age. 
So with me, for example, I went to the, the Islamic school Mushar when I was five years old. Tahfid, the they recite the Quran and everything. Yes, Tahfid, yeah. old, him, brother. And they just feed you all these lies and you grow up believing in them. Yes. And so it's just uh, brainwashing from a young And now yeah. they, you even hear people say, uh, I have I have two daughters and then I had friends who didn't know that I'm not Muslim anymore and they will give you an advice oh you should you should instead of letting them listen to music why don't you just put the Quran at night and then I say are you aware of the words in, yes. in the Quran killing and violent. all that scary stuff am I gonna let yeah. my children listen to that you know <laughs> And let them watch a nightmare on Elm Street just before exactly they, uh, they hear happen. that you know kill the non-muslims all these mm -hmm. uh, scary words that they shouldn't be aware of for that age Absolutely. right, age, right? Yeah. Yeah. didn't yeah. the pope say give give me a child until it's seven and they'll be catholic <laughs> the rest of their life jesus uh, <laughs> everyone is born muslim yes all of you were born muslim you're all yeah. apostates right now. <laughs> and we all Even Adam. In hell. So we'll see each other in hell. Right, Yasmin? All of you yes. in hell. I'll haram. be there, girl. I'll be partying all with the and the Backstreet yeah. Boys. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm bringing booze. <laughs> She'll bring I'll the bring gin. The Erkan will bring I'll the bring gin. All the haram. I'll bring all the haram things with me. <laughs> Even the, the, the oh, thing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand is they say uh, I'm also married to uh, a non-Muslim Canadian so they say every if you're a Muslim every child that you have is a haram child is going to go oh, to yes. us and yes. they're differently right yes um, my mother said that to me the day I got married she said uh, I am now scared to be a grandmother because they will all be haram yeah. and yeah. I was like, I'm going to consider that a congratulations or something, because that's the only thing you said to me. So, yeah. Yes, it's awful. It's, it's all about, you know, haram, the gallo, the infidels, it's this. And it, it's just, you know, it, yeah, Islam is so full of hate. And, and I just yeah. can't believe people get indoctrinated. And we, we came from and free ourselves from that, you know, discussed an indoctrination that we didn't even want it as a child because we were just we were born in it you know yeah and, and just leaving it you know the consequences that's why we speak because it's a must if we don't then here we have people in the west who are just crazy if they are not all of it i'm just talking about the woke and and the people who think islam is a religion of peace or a hijab it just means a piece of cloth on your head you know so, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing how many times I heard that word like haram, galo, you know, which is the infidel, galo, oh, you yes, know, I know that don't, you're going to be galo, this baby is haram if you marry somebody. It's just, it's just, it's, it's fear. It's fear. No, it's, it's, it's and and I'm, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Israel was one of the mm -hmm. Jews in general. It was mm -hmm. one of the, I mean, you mentioned it in your book, Yasmin. And uh, it was, I mean, uh, now that I think about it, I don't know if any of you know, but if you would ever buy a map from a Middle East country, yeah. you will see that Israel does not exist. They actually wow. uh, wiped it out. I mean, luckily it's small. I mean, I'm thinking, what if it was like Russia or something? <laughs> that would have been yeah. really <laughs> obvious. <laughs> but yeah, they wipe it out and then you never see an Israeli product in Middle East. That's I remember awful. when we lived in Dubai, my husband uh, drinks uh, sparkling water and you have this soda stream and the, the gas that you put in the soda stream that makes sparkling water is an Israeli product and only Israeli. And we could never find it in the whole time we were in Middle East, whether it was UAE, Bahrain, of course, Saudi, simply because it's an Israeli product and it's not there. So now that we're in France, we have that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I remember you talked about Seinfeld. That was really funny. It was yeah. around the time that I was watching Seinfeld. So yeah, yeah it's very, 
It's an obsession. It's an obsession with Jews all the time. My mom would like, yeah, she's, that's how I know all the, what Jewish, what are Jewish last names or even first names mm -hmm. is because I grew up with that, with my mom constantly on alert for the Jewish people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Under the tree? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Under the tree? Yes. Like they're just, they are under yeah. The tree somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the rocks and the trees are like, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew He's hiding a Jew. behind me. <laughs> Come yeah. kill him. Come kill him. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, I did not know that. Was it was it like a that's a hadith story or yes, <laughs> pretty much. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a hadith that says that the yeah. that Muslims and the the and Jews will fight until the Muslims have killed all of the Jews, and wow. Wow. even the rocks and the trees. If Jews try to hide behind the rocks or the trees, the rocks and the trees will say, "Oh, Muslim, there is a." There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come kill him. Mm -hmm. All except for one type of tree. One type oh, of tree that. can't speak <laughs> or oh, won't tell God. on the Jews. Oh, I it's just ridiculous. That yeah. You know, it's funny. I was watching, uh, I watch, um, so I don't know why, I watch a lot of criminal shows, you know, because of the detective and police and it's, you yeah. know, real. It's not like in the movies. So uh, I remember uh, Ted Bundy. I don't know if any of you know yes. Um, and his story, I think, I think it was him that they said we digged into his childhood and he actually had a terrible childhood, you know, with his family beating him up and his parents. And I remember sitting next to my husband and I said to him, should I have become a serial? Am I, am I being okay? Yeah. Like, is this behavior normal? Like I was treated exactly like Ted Bundy. But Way here worse. I am opening bottles of champagne on Sundays and saying everything is fine. Let's just have mm -hmm. a drink. Mm -hmm. And it's, we, are we being normal, Yasmin? I mean, somebody talk to me and tell me we're we're being fine. I, we're not I like have mad models. No, I know. I have that same thought all the time. I'm really grateful. But the, the, the violence that I was raised in, especially like how normalized that was, not just me, but how normalized violence is in Muslim majority countries and for Muslim families too. Like when you're a girl, you're beaten by your family when you're young and then you grow up and you get married and you're beaten by your husband. And it's just like this, and, and violence is encouraged in the men. You were talking about yeah. how you like to be in women's spaces because the men are so violent. It's like, if you're not a violent man, then you're not man enough. They want yes. that toxic masculinity. They want that aggression. That's what's valued. So I talked a little bit in my book about how my brother was into watching nature shows and Star Trek and stuff like that. He wasn't into like wrestling and sports. And he was humiliated for that because they, they value the kind of men that basically should be behind bars. Those are the kind of men that they value. And they say, yeah, this is good. Be, be toxic, be, be vicious, you know, yes. be aggressive. And so you're just you're just surrounded by violence all the time. And if these men grow up to become jihadis, if these men grow up to join Al-Qaeda or ISIS or whatever, it's not that far of a stretch. They've Absolutely. been doing this their whole life. This is totally normal, yeah. even for the women to join these things. We've heard from these ISIS wives where they, they very nonchalantly talk about people being beheaded, but it's okay because they were kuffar. We wouldn't do yeah, that to they were, Muslims. They were Shia. Unfortunately, yeah, or they're I, Shia. Yeah. I lost my brother for that. Um, I'm writing a book about it, but he joined ISIS. Um, oh, so. I am sorry to hear that. Yeah. That must hurt. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. So yes. Leora, you and I have to keep in touch because um, I have to make sure that I help you to get your story out. And, and, and when your book is out, I'll help you to try and get as much publicity as possible for that um yeah of course i'm sorry that i was just like blah, 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 ranting i didn't realize that i was gonna hit a nerve yeah it's so, <laughs> so hard to believe it 
No, I mean, this, this is, is what we're talking thing. about. It's there, right? It's all in our bodies. Like when you were talking about like you just about, about the music in the shower, it's just, we, we yeah. live our lives as much as we can. We move forward. We found happiness. We found love. We found freedom. But all of this stuff is in our bones and it just sits it there dormant. Yeah. Yes. And every now and then it just. Yeah. You don't know. Sometimes it's just out of the blue because you're, you're so free and you want every other woman to, yeah. to, to feel and be free like that. I wish for my mom to be like that and my sister. Um, and it just hits you. you. Yeah. Yes. You feel alone. Exactly. Yes. You want every that. other woman to feel the same way because they deserve it. They want they deserve to be free and not, not used by anyone. And yes, mean when you're talking about beating, everyone can beat you. I remember one incident my dad uh called called me to the um, the men room because we have separate rooms in the house. And then my my cousin was there and he he asked me to come in and I come in and he said, Oh, this is your cousin. Um, do you know that I give him the permission to beat you if he finds out that you're go you're doing anything that's haram? Mm. And my cousin is there, so imagine someone giving the other person the permission to do whatever he wants yeah. with, with you to you, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the same thing happened with my brother. He was on the phone with his friend, and then uh, he heard the friend heard my mom's voice over the phone and he and my mom was just calling one of us you know she was just calling out and then the friend got upset with my brother and he said do you want to tell your mother that there is a man on the phone do you do you want to tell her to lower her voice because i can hear her voice and my brother said what's wrong with that? I mean, she's called, everything is fine. Like you don't even think about that. And then he said, you're not a man. How could you let your mom's voice be heard over the phone? So this guy is over the other side of the phone and he's controlling our house. That's the mentality that these men have, that it's their job to control women. And they think they have permission. Like this guy, who is here all the way from Syria and he already have his own problems. He's a refugee, he fled home. He is here with his wife and his wife is taking French lessons to be part of the community and people and everything. And these services is for free and he's getting love and support from the French government. But yet he's going around telling other women what to do. And I find out I wasn't the only one. There was another lady, Syrian. She has a daughter and she never put hijab on her daughter. Simply because in the school, they told her she cannot come inside the school with hijab. So the mother said, I just have to let her go to school without it. And the mother is fine with it. The little girl is fine with it. But this man who has absolutely nothing to do with this family cannot stop leaving them alone. And I, I told her, I don't want to go that far, but you need to call the cops. I mean, yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't even want to say that. It's, it's extreme. But sometimes these people push you to do that. So well, yeah, it's... If he's that controlling of complete strangers around him, can you just imagine how controlling he is to his wife in the home? Absolutely. And we and all I just, know that they're violent to their wives. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's accepted. It's sanctioned. It's in the Quran. That's what you do. If you fear violence or disobedience from your wife, you beat her. Yes. <sighs> yes, absolutely. down. Yeah. Very well, Rena. <laughs> yes. I want to somehow end on a on a positive note. Um, and we're now talking about beating up wives. So that's not the note that I want to end on. <laughs> yeah, let's end it in the haram. But, <laughs> yeah. Fun haram yeah. Stuff. 
But actually, Michelle had, and we were talking before we came on with everybody else, and we sort of, she inspired me, and we came up with this idea that, um, see how she's got all those drinks behind her there? That was the inspiration for all this, where we figured we would invite all of the forgotten feminists that we had, that I've had on before, and we'd all get together, and you're all invited too, and we'd all have drinks together. Yes. Wouldn't that be fun? That <laughs> yes. would be awesome. I love it. Oh, <laughs> so have, super hot on party. Let's have some mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so of that sparkling water. Party. Yes. I mean, that's going to be the whole theme. Let's yeah. Or Israeli cool. sparkling water as well. Yes. yes. Go <laughs> and go camping. You've got to do it, Michelle. I'm Canadian. We go camping all the time. It's fantastic. And we yes. used to do it in the <laughs> desert. Yes. <laughs> We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Michelle, was there anything else that you wanted to add or speak about before we go? Because I just want to make sure that I've given you an opportunity to say anything that you wanted to say. Uh, I want to say thank you so much. I don't take things lightly. The fact that you are all here and spend some time with me, it really means a lot to me. I will never forget that. You guys are all beautiful, adorable. Remember how I started the conversation by saying I was nervous? Look at me now. I am no longer nervous. I am like <laughs> ranting away and laughing and talking. <laughs> it's all because of you guys. And if there is one thing I want to say is that I now feel free and extremely happy. It's an incredible, incredible thing what freedom can do. When I left home, I had nothing. I was basically fleeing and I was scared, but also not scared. And I remember I had a very tiny bag and it had like six or seven stuff with it, just the clothing. And that's all I wanted to take and leave everything behind that had related to toxic um, things and moments and memories and everything. I left everything behind. I had no money, nothing, but I didn't care because I wanted freedom. I came out to the world and I picked up many things on the way, friendship, um, moments, journeys, memories, everything. And every little thing inspired me, empowered me. And I am so, so thankful that I am here today. I mean, it's, it's such an incredible thing. I get emotional every time I say that. But I'm very, very happy. And freedom is everything. 100% agree with you. Thank you, Michelle. That was absolutely beautiful. I hope Thank that your you. voice is heard far and wide. Um, it was such an absolute joy and an absolute pleasure to have your joyful energy with us here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you, everybody who joined us. And thank you to everyone who's watching this on YouTube. And we'll see you guys at the Haram party. <laughs> 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 I love you.